Good morning. I believe that's the loudest cat I've ever heard. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at a passage in Philippians and kind of asking ourselves this question. Where does your mind live? What do I think about? What do I, where does my mind rest? So, this is a question that people ask each other. I know that that's a question that my wife and I often ask each other when it's just kind of quiet. What you thinking about? Often the answer's nothing. <laughs> or it's what? <laughs> a friend of ours just recently said uh, something I believe is true that marriage is 90% yelling what from different rooms. <laughs> so what you thinking about? Such a simple question. But what kind of thinking are we talking about here? Puzzling over something, you've got an issue, you're trying to work it out, you're trying to figure out a solution. Brooding about something, oh boy, you're either dreading it or you're upset about it. Agonizing over something, I know, I know, we had to go get blood work the other day. And I knew that it's not a big deal, but I still didn't like it. <laughs> And so I was agonizing over the anticipation of being stabbed with the needle. And of course, once it happened, it was like no big deal. But my agonizing ahead of it was a far bigger deal in my head. Obsessing about something where you just can't drop the subject till your friends are saying to you, can't you talk about anything else? And your answer is, no, I can't. Or the most common, zoning out. That's the, what you thinking about? What? <laughs> Much of our society doesn't really seem to be thinking at all. <laughs> and some of you are going, why are they laughing? <laughs> if you're still lost at the end, I'll come back to this slide and you can figure it out. <laughs> and we are living at a time when a lot of people's thoughts are pretty much out of control. And the results are everywhere. A lot of fear. Either fear of what is happening or fear of what they, they think will happen. A lot of anger. A lot of accusations. Lots of overreaction. And lots of irrational thinking. I ran across a quote by Robert Heinlein, the famous uh, author, where he said that rational thinking was becoming lost in America. He wrote this back in the 50s. And he said America has become a place where entertainers and athletes are mistaken for people of importance. And I thought, boy, yeah. And he says, you know, when you pay an athlete a million dollars a year, he assumes that everything that he say, says is of great value. Even his opinions on, say, foreign policy or something like that. And, and you know, our, our nation goes through that. Our, our children um, uh, they're sitting back there today, were in a logic class years ago. We homeschooled our kids up until they went into high school and, and they were in this logic class and they were dealing with the logic fallacies. And it happened to be an election year and so they were signed. The, the assignment was watch any political speech and see how many of this list of logic fallacies you can find. All of them. Every single one of them. Because the rational thinking is not really really so prevalent in our minds, which brings up two questions. One is, why is it important to control your thinking? What's the big deal? Isn't it okay to just zone out? Isn't it okay to overreact? One of my teachers had this picture in her, uh, in her room of, a, of a, a man, and he's like this, and it says, but I can't function when I'm calm. And I said, so why is it important to control our thinking? And then, how do I know if my thinking is controlled? How do I get there? Certainly somebody who is, who is very reactionary or, or rational in their thinking, they probably don't know that they're irrational in their thinking. They probably think everybody else is irrational in their thinking. So how do I know? Well, first question, why is it important? Well, because it keeps us from being influenced by nonsense. I believe this is the greatest source of nonsense I found in recent years, is this one. Uh, lots of things get posted up. And I'll have a friend on an issue that's on this side and a friend that's on this side of the issue and they know each other and they love each other and they're friends with each other and they each know the other one to be a reasonable person and yet this person says, everybody who's on the other side thinks like this and it's some wild, crazy, extreme thing. And the other one posts up and says, well, this is the same. And neither one of them has really read through what they posted or thought, do you realize you're talking about each other? 
Oh, oh, well, not you. Well, then it can't be everybody, you know? It keeps you from being influenced by that. But this quote from Amy Grant stuck with me years ago. Whatever goes round and round in our heads eventually takes root in our hearts. And I think that's one of the most important reasons that we need to control our thinking. Because it really changes who you are. We tend to find what we are attuned to. You may be familiar with an old uh, story about a woodsman um, on his first trip to New York City. And he's walking along with his friend and the cars are roaring by and there's all the people on the sidewalk jostling him around. And the woodsman stops for him and he says, you hear that? And his friend says, what? And he goes, cricket. You hear that cricket? And his friend says, there's no way in all this din you're going to hear a cricket. And his friend pulls out a dime and he drops on the pavement and 50 heads swivel around. He says, you hear what you listen for. We tend to find that to which we are attuned. Second question, how do I know if my thinking is controlled? How do I know? Well, what do you talk about? You know, what do you talk about with your friends? What do you talk about with, with new acquaintances? What do you talk about when you talk to yourself? All of us talk to ourselves, right? Sometimes we argue with ourselves, which is really funny to watch somebody else doing that. But we tend to talk about things, okay? Well, what do you look at? When I go on to in, go into books, when I go into movies, if I go onto the internet, what am I looking at? You know, it kind of it it sort of feeds the, my interest. So what what am I looking at? Where do I go for information? Some folks say I'll go that place for information because I believe that information to be accurate, but I won't go over there. Um, it's always amazing to me that still to this day, when you go to check out in the grocery. Uh, store, things like the Inquirer are still on the stands. And Bigfoot has married Elvis yet again. You know, and, P and I, as a writer, that must be like the best creative writing gig on the planet. Because anything you can come up with, you can write a story about that. You know, man with 11 toes invents a new form of calculation. I mean, it's just any, pretty much anything you want to do. And yet there are people that read it and they believe it. Wow. Bigfoot, gosh, this is his fourth marriage, isn't it? I mean, it's, they, they'll go just about any place for information. But this is probably, for me, my biggest test. Where, what do I find myself thinking about when my mind is at rest? You know, if I'm just daydreaming, or if I'm just, just in a peaceful state, I'm zoning out there, there might be something going on in my head. What is that thing? What is that? So where does our culture look? Well, three main sources, internet, news, and TV. And I'll, I'll concert, could include with TV movies. Um, but this is where people really go to be informed. And uh, with the internet, you guys remember that commercial? It might be old enough for you guys not to remember it, where there was this woman and she's saying to her friend, oh, I'm going with this French guy. And she's, uh, I'm going out with a French guy. And, he, and the friend says, where'd you meet this French guy? She says, oh, on the internet. And he says, how do you know he's French? She says, well, everything you read on the internet is true. And he says, where did you read that? And she says, the internet. And this dude walks up that is clearly not French. And he goes, <laughs> bonjour, and walks off with the girl. So, you know, what we get there, everything's true, right? But here's the deal. Five of the top ten search categories of 2017, what did people look for? There are some things they look for. Translate is always in the top 10. Maps is always in the top 10. But the others roll around, but they don't roll very far. And five of them were pornography related. They were numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. But that's what a lot of folks are looking for. That's what they're putting into their minds. In the news, okay, we go, you know, we turn on the news channel. And what do we hear about? Well, the top 10 stories of Sunday when we started camp, eight of them were about violent deaths of some person, either through at the hands of another person or in an accident. The other two were about some kind of sexual assault. That was the main news stories. That's what they throw at you saying, this is the most important thing for you to know about. And when it comes to TV, of the top five shows of 2017, all of them involved graphic sex and violence or were a horror show, which I guess the violence is still in there. So 
because of this fluid nature of media, I mean, when all of us old fogies watch TV, is, and when we were, we were your age, um, things were never as graphic. Never. You know, Black Bart would get shot by the Lone Ranger and he'd go, ah, and he'd fall down. But there was no blood, there was no gore, there was none of that graphic quality to it. But because of the way it works in our culture, we talked about this yesterday, truth becomes determined by consensus rather than by fact. And ethical relativity, despite its inherent contradiction, is very popular. Do you guys know what ethical relativity is? Did I mention that on maybe day one or two? Yes? No? Hands for no. Okay, ethical relativity is saying, uh, I do what's right for me and you do what's right for you and we're good. Remember talking about this? Yeah? Where we, I made the comparison that you know, the Nazis thought, the, if I believe in that, then I believe that the Nazi mentality was just as good as my own. But we don't really believe like that. And that's part of irrational thinking. And the saying goes, if you don't choose where you're going to settle down, you'll settle down wherever you are. And that's really true of our thought life. If we're not really particular about controlling and, and um, focusing our thoughts on the proper things, we'll kind of go wherever the input that hits us pushes us. So we, we, that's where a lot of folks wind up worrying about things and they wind up so fearful is that every time I turn on the news, it's something terrible. Very rarely is it something nice, you know, where, you know, this guy did this really awesome thing. He saw this guy that was broken out on the side of the road and he stopped to help change the tire. And by golly, there was, uh, his grandmother was sick. And so they, he, instead of fixing the car, he ushered him into the, his car and he rushed him off to the hospital. You don't hear much of that. And so if I'm not thinking about things, I, my mind will simply go where my input pushes it. And that gets really rough. Well, if all of these sources have faults to them, where do I go? Okay? It, you know, it's one thing for me to stand up here and say, here are some obvious problems with these things, but okay, well, where do I go? Well, then I go, need to go to that which is abiding. All right? Not a word we use a lot anymore, abiding. It just means things that will last, things that will endure. So where do I go? We go to that which is abiding. We go to that which has its roots beyond culture. Is Christianity only an American thing? Is it only a Western world thing? Is it only a Northern Hemisphere thing? Only a Southern thing? It's absolutely pervasive throughout the world because it goes beyond culture. It's not just relegated to one tiny bit of culture. And as we become students of the word, that gives you something where you say, yes, I understand that the news told me that these terrible things are happening, but those terrible things that happen today are not an indication that God is off of his throne. Because the word shows me that. The, God told me in his word, there are going to be these kind of things. You are going to hear about wars. You're going you're to see an increase in these kind of violent things. That just means that my time is coming closer. That just means that I am still at work in the world. So today's passage is part of a series of positive exhortations that come right ahead of this passage. One of them is stand firm. Stand on what you believe. Don't be, be swayed by other things. Just hang right in there. Be in unity. Agree with each other. Don't fall into the trap that says, well, we'll just agree to disagree. No, I'll do the hard work and we'll work with each other until we both come to the truth. If I'm not worried about whether I'm right or you're right, then I don't have that emotional bond to it. I'm not worried about, well, but I have to win the argument. I don't care who wins the argument as long as we find the truth together. That's being in unity. Rejoice in the Lord. Well, that's a pretty positive exhortation. Let your gentleness be evident. I do have to tell you, some of you guys have, have heard my wife and I talk to you about this, but that's something about Chehi that has just really made an impact on my wife and I. We have been on faculty of loads of music camps over the years, and most of those music camps were Christian camps, but we have not ever come across a camp that has the gentleness evident here, where the staff with each other are so gentle and so caring. The way the staff are with you is so gentle and caring and the way that you guys are with, the, with each other. It's, it, it's something that's really made a mark on us that that gentleness is evident. I believe that, that this one is one you guys are doing really, really well on. Don't worry about anything. This is a little harder, right? Yeah, we tend to worry about things. I was all worried about getting stuck with the needle in my arm. And then, of course, it was kind of over before I was, you know, the amount of worry I put into it and the actual event were 
not really in good proportion. Present your request to God with a thankful heart. Every prayer that I've heard since I've been there has followed that pattern. Every one of them. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch. And you will know God's peace. And that's been kind of a nice thing, you know. You guys have put your cell phones away. You've been here present with each other. And this is a pretty peaceful environment. All right, all of this leads us to this. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So let's unpack this a little bit. I'm going to do quick word studies on these because often the word that comes out of the Greek into the English might have some different connotations. So what I'll do is I'll look at places where that same word appears other places in text. This in 1 Peter, I've written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. Let me get to something else. The, the next one, I also, if you're, as appearing your own witness, your testimony is not valid. So true, reliable, valid. It used to be that in Appalachia, in our country, people would refer, use the word true to mean real. If, if you um, gave somebody a silver uh, pendant, they'd say that's true silver. And it meant it's real silver. It's not nickel plate or something that will rub off. It's real. And even Peter in prison, when the angel appears and leads him out, and he went out uh, to follow, he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. So that's the true. Whatever is real, what's ever genuine, that's one of the things we're looking at. Whatever is honorable. Now this word semnos is used in two different, very different ways. The world looks at it this way. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Lofty, splendid, magnificent. But in terms of the New Testament, it's used this way. Deacons likely are to be men worthy of respect. Honorable, that which is worthy of respect. That which is dignified. That's what this honorable words is. Worthy of respect. So when you think about those things upon which you dwell, are they things that are honorable? Are they things that are dignified? Are they wor really things worthy of respect? Whatever is right. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man. Being upright. And this I love. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. What is correct in that sense? Um, and, but this word is, is the same word heard uh, here when, his wife, when Pilate's wife sends him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. That's the same word. Exactly the same word. Righteous, innocent, untainted. Whatever is pure. Um, this one really pretty much the, just the same, same word as you would, you would think of. A pure of being um, that which is not um, tainted by something else. That, that which has not been diluted. That, that which is really, well, pure. Whatever is lovely. This is the easiest one of all. Whatever is lovely. I took that picture. That's why I put it in there. Whatever is of good repute. Good repute, it says in the NASB. Whatever is admirable in the NIV. So what exactly is something of good repute or admirable? Well, it's the opposite of this. Do you guys notice, and, and when you've looked through the scriptures, that any time gossip is mentioned as a sin, it's in the same list as murder? There's no hierarchy or, or you know, gradations of sin. It's right in the same, same pocket as that. So whatever is of good repute. You know, is this really something I should be listening to about this other person when this person's telling, do you know that terrible thing they did? Should I really be a part of that? If there's any, any excellence, this again, also pretty obvious, but excellence, goodness. So I, where I might, um, might find out the news story about this terrible thing that happened, but I don't really want to obsess about that. I want to stay there. Moral excellence, it says in the NASB. Anything worthy of praise. We all know what praise is around here. We do a good bit of it. But one of the places the same word is used, we, we, uh, we translate it commendable. What is it, what is it to, for something to be commendable? If somebody commends you, what is that? Anybody? 
Somebody, somebody gets a commendation in the military. What is that? Yes? It's sort of like a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same word right in there, right? So a commendation is a nod that you've done something correct. If you've really, really done the right thing at the right time, that's commendable. You know, some of you guys, I've noticed, you know, as you go through a doorway, somebody's struggling through with a large instrument, somebody just jumps over and grabs the door from them. Yeah, that's, a, that's commendable. You didn't just leave them in their distress, you helped them out. Let your mind dwell on these things. Okay, let's see what this one is about. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is wanted, warranted by what I do or say. So that no one will credit me with more. You do not realize, understand. So it's really all parts of our thinking. Whether we're figuring something out, whether we are um, preparing something, we're trying to understand something, it's all part of that same idea. Taking into account, really gathering all the information possible. Whether I consider what I regard, I count on, I reason, think about. These are all places in scripture that use those words to refer to where your mind dwells. So letting your mind dwell is not a passing thought, but it's a state of mind where our thinking resides. This is where you are all the time. There are going to be times where you may be um, panicked, where you may overreact to things. And those of themselves are not a serious problem. What's, what becomes a problem is those become characteristic of you. If your mind is there most of the time, you know. Uh, my daughter had a friend in, in high school that in order to dominate my daughter's time, she had some crisis every single day. And only my daughter could help her. She was the only one. And this, this girl, really it was a way of controlling my daughter to make her, you know, oh, but I have to rely on you. And every day was some kind of catastrophe that had her in tears and her mind was just absolutely gone. Nothing ab about what we're, we're reading today. So whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, whatever is, if there are any excellencies or if anything praiseworthy, let your mind dwell there. If this is the fence that you put around your mind. You're not swayed by nonsense. You don't live in fear. God's word and the way he directs us to live our lives gives us a wall of protection around your mind. You know, this is, this is where the peace that passes all understanding comes from. Is the idea that if this is what I protect my mind with, then I'm not overly fearful when I read the news. I'm not undone when things don't go my way. Because I'm always being reminded of God's truth. I'm always being reminded of his presence. I'm always being reminded of the promises that he makes for our lives. And it really changes us. Letting our minds dwell on these things both protects and directs our thinking. And that's super important because if it directs your thinking, it helps direct where your life goes. You know? Do you understand what I'm saying there? If, my, if it not only protects my mind from being assaulted by those kinds of, of things out there in the world that would love to take it over, but it keeps me from being pushed along a path so that my life looks like something else. As a Christian, your life is going to look different than your friends. And there's going to be that point where your friends are all upset about some issue and you're calm. Why? Because you know that God is still on his throne. Because you know that he has still got you on, right in the palm of his hand. And even though this thing looks pretty terrible, you know it's not going to overwhelm you. But those who don't have that assurance are completely undone when things go wrong. So, 
I held you guys late yesterday, and today I will not do that. How close am I? Oh, perfect. We're going to get out even a little earlier. Choose where your mind will live. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If my mind is protected by those things, that becomes who I am. If it's things that are praiseworthy and pure and righteous and excellent, that becomes characteristic of you. And you're not blown about by the waves. You're able to stand firm, even in the midst, in the midst of good things or in the midst of bad things. But as you, because you know it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. The peace of my mind, the rest of my spirit, is not de determined by circumstance. It's determined by the presence of God. My brother used to have a little uh, plaque about Yay Big that stood on his desk and it said, Joy is not the absence of suffering, but the presence of God. And this is a big part of it. If my mind is controlled, if my thinking is unswayed because I'm really focusing on the truths and on the excellence and on the goodness of God, then I get to experience a far more peaceful life here in the midst of all the troubles of the world than I otherwise can handle. Would you guys pray with me, please? Father, we, we rejoice in the peacefulness that you have given us here. This has been a wonderful place for all of us to come and be able to be relaxed and at home and unassailed by troubles. Lord, we ask that you would protect our minds and our hearts in the way that we think about things and let us be calm and rational and assured by the promises in your word that you still control everything that happens around us, both in our lives and without. Your son Jesus gave us this as one of the many gifts of salvation that we could have a peace that goes beyond all human understanding. And Father, we thank you that you give us very practical things in your word like this that tell us how we can live, tell us how, how, to, let our, how to work our minds. Thank you, Lord, for this unbelievable love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.